Hello friends. If you're new here, my name is Lee. I share videos every week on all things photography, including gear reviews like today. Subscribe and like this video if at any point you find this video helpful or entertaining. I also have long form courses available to my members. So if you are interested in that, you will find a link in the description to learn more about channel membership. Now I shared my review of the Z6 II last week. In it, I said at the beginning of testing that it wouldn't take me very long to form my opinion about the Z6 II because I have used all of the Z cameras and I have owned or own most of them. And the same is true of the Z7 II. I knew prior to receiving this loaned body from Nikon that it would be like the rest of Nikon's Z stable of camera bodies. Easy to use, especially if you've used Nikon cameras in the past. I knew that image quality would be superb, especially using Nikon Z mount lenses. Really, any camera on the market today is capable of providing superb image quality. I knew video quality would be good because I've been filming the majority of videos for this channel with the Z7 since I purchased it when it launched. The real question was, would the updates on the Z7 II be enough for me to want to trade in my beloved and much relied upon Z7? And that's the question that I'll answer in this video. And in the process of seeing my photos and my videos and hearing my opinions, hopefully you will be able to decide if this might be the camera for you. Right out of the gate, the Z7 II looks and feels exactly the same as the Z6, Z6 II, and Z7, although it is slightly heavier than its predecessor. It's easy to hold and to use, and if you've used Nikon bodies before, the menus and terminology will be familiar to you. Though I do use many brands nowadays, I started using Nikon DSLRs many years ago, so Nikon bodies just always feel like home to me. The Z7 II has a lot of pixels. It has the highest pixel count of the Z cameras alongside the Z7. In fact, it has the same full frame 45.7 megapixel sensor as its predecessor. And that means image quality, it means cropping, pixel peeping. I have no complaints about this sensor, it is stellar. The Z7 II maintains the same native ISO range of 64 to 25,600. I took this photo in Yellowknife, Canada of the Aurora Borealis with the Z7. Although I wasn't able to take the Z7 II to anywhere quite so spectacular, this gives you an idea of the extreme circumstances in which the Z7 II will excel. Like the Z6 II, the Z7 II gains a second processor, and that means more power, which has implications in many areas of the camera's performance. Responsiveness, buffer, autofocus, and this is where I was really impressed. I'll get to autofocus in a moment, but the buffer is almost unbelievably deeper. I did a quick comparison between my Z7 and the Z7 II, and I actually laughed out loud. <laughs> the difference is huge. You can hear that buffer is three times as deep, but seeing it in action is something else. Check it out. Of course, how many frames you can actually capture in one burst will depend upon how you have your camera set. But even using tracking autofocus, shutter priority, and auto ISO, which means that the camera was doing calculations between each shot, you maintain an impressive buffer for a camera with 45 megapixels. I haven't used a camera produced in the last bunch of years that couldn't autofocus accurately, even in relatively low light. So if that's what you're looking for, you're good to go with the Z7 II. It even has the handy joystick on the back of the camera for moving around your autofocus point. 
Where cameras set themselves apart these days is in the autofocus detection and tracking features. The Z7 II has human and animal eye detection autofocus and tracking for stills and video, though it only works for cats and dogs. I tested it with my energetic, hairy brother here, and like my Z7, it definitely picked up his eyes. As for humans, Raymond and I used human eye detect for these portraits in the snow as well. Again, it performed well as expected. The Z62 and Z72 gain the ability to use human or animal eye detection in wide area autofocus. And this is handy if you are photographing more than one person or if you want the camera to be the fastest it can be. It will only look in that area for the eyeballs and faces. Aside from eye detection, the autofocus tracking is improved overall on the Z72. This bunny was stubbornly staying in one place, so I moved the camera around to see if it would stay locked onto its body, and it did. I captured this burst of shots with a relatively unsteady hand at 500 millimeters. The backlit bird is just another dark spot on this little island in the pond, and I was impressed that the camera didn't jump off the bird. It didn't jump into its reflection or onto one of the rocks. I've leaned hard on my Z7 for most of the videos on this channel since its release in 2018. I use it here in the studio to create formal videos with the camera on a tripod, or I'm out capturing the environment around me and using the camera handheld. The Z7 can shoot 8-bit video in 4K at 30 frames per second, or 1080 at 120 frames per second, straight to the memory card. The Z7 II gains the ability to capture 4K at 60 frames per second, though it does have a slight crop. It is a really nice option to have 60 frames per second. But more importantly to me is the ability to capture 4K 30 frames per second in 10-bit. Sadly, you do need to use an external recorder for this, just like I usually do with the Z7. And right now, only the Atomos Ninja 5 will do it, though Blackmagic will be made compatible in the future. And you can choose N-Log or HLG, which is hybrid log gamma, for those who require the most control in video post-processing. The difference between 8-bit and 10-bit video is simply that you have more latitude to grade the footage in post-processing. So if you are in a difficult lighting situation for one reason or another, or you just want to push some levels or colors, it can be a very helpful asset. Beyond that, just like with the original Z7, you will be able to send the camera into Nikon for a paid upgrade to 12-bit RAW video capability, again to an external recorder only. One change from the original Z7 that made a lot of folks happy is dual card slots. One is XQD or CF Express, and the other is SD. As I said in my review of the Z6 II last week, I don't like having two different card types in the two slots. I would much prefer having two of the same type but that is my opinion. I know there are plenty of folks out there that don't mind or even like having one of each. Either way, the two slots allow you to record to one and then the other, or to both cards at the same time, or raw files to one and JPEG to the other. The battery life is expanded on the Z7 II to 440 still photos or 105 minutes of video, though these numbers will completely depend on how you have the camera set. There is a new version of the ENEL15 battery here. This uses the ENEL15C. You can use previous versions of the battery, though with this new ENEL15C, the Z7 II gains the ability to use the camera plugged in via USB-C. And this is so handy, especially if I'm using the interval timer to create a time lapse in the field. In the past, I've had to use an AC adapter plug-in battery, so this is a welcome change. And speaking of battery life, Nikon released a new battery grip, the MBN11, which has controls for using the camera in the vertical orientation, and you can hot swap batteries while using the camera. You may have noticed that my review of this camera was similar to my review of the Z6 II last week. And that's because my opinions of the two cameras are much the same. These two cameras bring some very nice updates to the already solid Z6 and Z7. Any one of the updates may speak to you. It may be the one thing that you are waiting for to jump into the Z system. While all of the Z bodies are solid options, the Z7 and the Z7 II stand out to those of you that want the utmost in image quality and the ability to pixel peep or crop. 
The Z7 II gives you dual card slots, the deeper buffer, the better overall autofocus, as well as the ability to charge the camera via USB-C while the camera's in use. It has the natural Nikon colors straight out of the camera, the same great ease of use. It has many wonderful features and a top-notch sensor. You can use many F-mount lenses with the FTZ adapter. I used my 200 to 500 millimeter F5.6 and independent lens manufacturers are starting to make lenses for the Z-mount. Viltrox is making some. You may have seen that I have a Viltrox 85 millimeter F1.8 lens, which I will be reviewing soon. I do also own a Viltrox 20 millimeter F1.8 manual focus lens and a lens baby Composer Pro 2. But now to answer the question, Will I be selling my Z7 off to KEH and putting in an order for the Mark II? Not yet. I'm happy with the Z7 for my photo and video work here in the studio, for landscape and nature work, for astrophotography where it absolutely excels. That being said, the things that stand out to me as being real life advances, places where I noticed a difference between the Z7 and the Z7 II when I was out shooting in the real world, are the improved autofocus tracking and the deeper buffer, as well as the ability to charge via USB-C while using the camera. There are a number of situations where those are helpful, but wildlife photography and time lapses are two of them for me. However, because I do own several other camera bodies like the Sony Alpha 7 R4 and the Leica SL2, I don't need those capabilities on the Z7 right now. If I didn't have those bodies or if I didn't constantly have a loaner body from one brand or another here in the studio for testing, or if I had a bottomless piggy bank, I would definitely go for it. And honestly, <laughs> I may change my mind. I have been known to keep my cool for a few months, but then end up making a purchase. And once summer rolls around and I am back out time-lapsing with the Milky Way again, who knows what will happen. I do love that USB-C charging. <laughs> but for now, I'm sticking with my Z7. All right, everyone. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out channel membership if you want access to long-form courses, my eBooks, and more. There is a link in the description to learn more about that. And you can always use the comment section if you have any questions about channel membership. I will also, of course, have a link to the Z7 II as well as all the lenses that I used with it. And let me know if you have any questions about the Z series. Thank you to Nikon for the loaner and thank you for watching. <laughs>